is called to order. First item of business will be the second agenda item, reading of the appeals statement. Appeal of decisions from the Community Oversight Board. Pursuant to the provisions of section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, please take notice that decisions of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County Community Oversight Board may be appealed to the Chancery Court of Davidson County for review under a common law writ of certiorari. Any appeal must be filed within 60 days after entry of a final decision by the board. Any person or other entity considering an appeal should consult with an attorney to ensure that time and procedural requirements are met. Thank you. So now moving to the next item, establishing a quorum. I will take note, um, oh, and I'm Phyllis Hildreth, your first vice chair, who is temporarily serving in the role of chair that uh, we have identified that there are six members, including myself, present. Uh, there are two current announced and noticed vacancies on the board. That means we have a total board string. Oh, seven members. Hey, Ms. Whistle. Um, so the total size of the board today is nine members eligible to vote. There are seven present. Therefore, we find that we do have a quorum. So at this point, we'll move to the next item, approval of the minutes. The minutes have been distributed in advance to the board members, I believe, posted on the website. Um, is there a motion to accept? Thank you. Judge Brown moves to approve. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, Mr. Wynn. Any discussion? Amendment modification? Hearing none, all in favor of accepting the minutes as posted, note, signify by indicating aye. 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 Any opposed? Ayes have it. The, mo the minutes are approved. Next item will be the election of the Community Oversight Board Chair. Um, our former chair, Mr. Arnold Hayes, is one of the two uh, vacancies. He is no longer eligible to serve on the board. And while we miss him, that leaves us one short in the executive committee. We do not have a chair. The nomination committee has met in a duly noticed meeting. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to say that was July, August 15th. Is that correct? On August 15th. Um, and I believe that there is a slate that will serve as a motion for nomination from that committee. May I hear the committee report? Y'all, what'd you do? Okay, um, for us uh, that we received, the nomination committee, we saw one name that was eligible for the election process. And what we found out later, there was a second name, but it didn't meet the deadline. And what can happen today, that person that didn't meet the deadline uh, can be nominated from the floor. And then if that's the case, we can proceed. Excellent, so if you'd like to give the nomination from the committee. What name? The name. Uh, what was the name? <laughs> Board member, uh, no. Milner, I'm sorry, Milner. That was the name that um, that uh, met uh, the requirement, and I believe Judge Brown had made a suggestion, but it did not uh, meet the deadline. But he still can make a, a motion from the floor. Thank you. So we have a motion from the committee for Board Member Milner to. Um, be eligible as a candidate for election. Mr. Milner, do you accept that nomination? I do. Thank you. Are there any other nominations from the floor at this time? Member Brown, you're recognized. I'd like to uh, nominate uh, Mr. Goddard. Thank you. Mr. Goddard, you have heard the nomination. Are you accepting the nomination at this time? Uh, yes, I did not seek it, but it's the wrong board. Officer. And Yes, I did not seek it, but if it's the will of the board, I will serve as best as I can. Thank you. Do we have any other nominations at this point? 
Hearing none, help me out. I understand that the nomination from the committee is a motion. And uh, I guess the nomination from the floor also is amended to that. So we now have a slate of two candidates, Mr. Milner and Mr. Goddard. Uh, if I can get some direction, I see councils here. Thank you for helping me out in attempt. Um, do what, we take? What we can do, uh, we can close the nomination under the said names. So you want to move to close the nomination? Uh, under the said name. Okay, motion under said names. Um, there's a motion, is there a second? Second. All in favor on the motion, signify by indicating aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Aye. The motion carries. So we have a motion on the floor for nomination of these two named individuals. Is there any uh, focused discussion? Jim Penny? None, then call the question. We will proceed in this election by roll call vote of each member present. At that time, we ask the member to indicate their choice of um, the person that they're voting for to fulfill the vacancy for chair of this board. Director Fitchert will tally the votes and give us the result at the end of the vote. We have an odd number of persons here so, and I will vote last, so we should not have a tie. So with that said, I guess we'll just go in order. Mr. Holloway, how about you? Okay, I vote for Milliger. Thank you. Judge Brown? Mr. Goddard. Thank you. Mr. Goddard? I'll vote for myself. Thank you. Mr. Witzel? Milner. Mr. Milner? I'll vote for myself. Thank you. Mr. Wynn? Uh, Milner. Uh, Milner, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, Ms. Fitchard, what's the count? Um, four for Mr. Milliner and two for Mr. Goddard. Thank you. I vote for Mr. Milliner as well. And so um, I believe that's in. We have just elected a new board chair. And congratulations. Thank congratulations. And thank you. And I'm passing the gavel. <laughs> So at this time, uh, it has been an honor to serve in this capacity, and now uh, I will retreat to the back bench and uh, ask our newly elected board chair to continue leading us through the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair. And uh, thank you all. Uh, and uh, pretty much like uh, Mr. Goddard said, I'm going to do the very best I can. And uh, I appreciate it and consider it an honor. Uh, let's move right on uh, beyond chair's remarks, uh, which I'll probably have more of at the next meeting, <laughs> uh, into the executive director's report. Uh, director Fitcher. Thank you. Congratulations. I'm excited to serve with you in this capacity. And if you need me for anything, just let me know. Absolutely. And since I'm going on vacation, um, someone else is going to be here. But um, when I get back, I would like to sit down with you and talk about what, you know, the day, what we do and the functions. So. Uh, and brief you on what happens next. So thank you. Um, we've had some personnel updates. So we posted two investigator positions, one social worker, as well as the assistant director. Those are open now. So if you have anyone that you know, um, the investigator position closes on Friday. Um, I encourage you to send them our way. Um, we are coming um, up to our, we have five positions, and so hopefully we'll get them all filled pretty quickly. Um, as of course, as I've always raised this um, issue, um, we are having some trouble with finding qualified applicants to meet the, um, the to meet the voter registration requirement. And so, um, hopefully, we will be able to meet and, and meet our, our our goal um, of hiring two investigators out of this small pool of numbers of qualified applicants. Um, uh, the next thing is we wanted to congratulate Mr. Gavin Crowell Williamson for being selected as a new research analyst too. Um, I know we didn't bring that up last time because he's been in position now for several weeks, but I just wanted to um, inform you all publicly that he is our new lead researcher on our team. 
<laughs> we had two, uh, well, we've had three meetings. We had the executive committee meeting, which was a special call meeting that happened on August the 2nd. Um, we also, and that meeting was to discuss next steps regarding the editing of body worn camera video footage by MMPD employees. Um, we also had a regular executive and nominations committee meeting. Those happened on August the 15th. That information, um, you know, some of it was, I think that one of the, the meetings was uh, recorded in live stream. So you can find that on our, on our socials. Uh, we continue to do training um, for professional growth. St staff and board members attended, some board members attended a, a NACO webinar training called Policing Regulation and Oversight, the Trends to Problems and Solutions. Um, and myself and I think it was uh, Mr. Carl Williamson and uh, Ms. Robinson attended the fourth quarter of the Partners in Care uh, meeting that was hosted by the Metro Public Health Department as well as MMPD and the Mental Health Co-op. They were beginning to say this was the close out of their pilot program and they're now um, moving towards um, working with um, having or, or they still are in a pilot program for something else, which is a non-police response to those critical incidents. So um, they are going to work on their numbers. Um, Gavin's been working with them to um, give us more data that you know we can share with you once we get that information. Um, it seems to be working well that that particular program and that pilot um, and the numbers that they had when we attended that meeting with other stakeholders showed how many calls for service. It seems like it's moving in a very successful way. So I'm very happy about that. Um, I had several meetings over the last month. Um, I met with um, the mayor's chief of staff, the mayor's policy director, Mr. Bunton, um, and then MMPD's acting chief, Mike Hager. He was filling in for the chief while he was out of town. Um, I also met with, or I attended with the rest of my colleagues, um, the public, the Metro Council's Public Health and Safety Committee special call meeting regarding the EEC response times and their staffing issue. <clears throat> they are having some trouble as well with getting people to work, you know, at the EEC um, or ECC. It could be a number of things, mainly um, the salary. Uh, I think is one of the issues. Um, I also met with Captain Christopher Gilder and Commander Carlos Lara in regards to um, our policy recommendation tracking, and I let Mr. Uh, Mr. Williamson can tell you more about that. He led that meeting. Um, we did some. We continue, thank goodness, to do some uh, outreach. Uh, we attended the fifth annual Silence the Violence event that was hosted by Kiva Incorporated, um, and we shared our services with the community over at the Hadley Park location. Um, and it was very successful. Um, I also, myself and Ms. Robinson met with the organization Mothers Over Murder, MOM, um, to hear from a mother um, who has lost a child to gun violence um, and just kind of getting um, connected with that group. They've asked, they asked us to come and meet with her, so we did that. Um, we have our next meeting in the community, which is in se it's September the 28th. It's gonna be at the Pruitt Library over in Napier Gardens. Um, and then October the 26th, we're gonna have a meeting um, at the Coleman Community Center, which is on Nolensville Road. Um, so that would happen October the 26th and September the 28th. Um, so Mr. Um, Gavin uh, Crowell Williamson, he worked on the body worn camera policy advisor proposal. So I'm talking a little bit about research. Um, he's also worked on an informational report and that, that was sent to you all. We're gonna discuss it today. He met with Metro's public health um, epidemiologists to discuss uh, what we talked about a moment ago in partners in care to get that data um, and also a departmental collaboration. He also attended the Sycamore's Institute for Fees and Fines. So he's been really busy and doing it alone. So we'll be looking really um, forward to hiring um, our professional specialist, which is now called a digital evidence and data technician and also our research analyst one. Um, the complaints continue to pour in, um, you know, and, and really with just the three investigators, they are really overwhelmed with the calls that they were getting. Um, we received a total of, oh, I didn't have this in here. I got to correct that. We received a total of five complaints since our last board meeting in July, and we received a total of 22 non-complaint contact calls for service. Um, and so, you know, sometimes those calls are also 
they're, they're time consuming. Like with pe somebody will call, like we had a call recently that said, hey, there was a, you know, a, a, a police officer in, in uniform in a truck that did such and such and such and such. And we have to determine, you know, where that, it, was, it a, was it a Metro? Was it Bell Mead? Was it Brentwood? You know, we don't know. So they spend time trying to find out who is supposed to receive that call. Like we have to refer it out unless it's an MMPD officer. So those things take time and a lot of those calls come in where we're trying to figure out like who, who is, do we have jurisdiction to handle this call? Um, the body worn camera update, um, I will say, and we, and we had one request for records that we received with no issues. Um, and like I said, I met with the representatives from the mayor's office and MMPD to have a discussion related to the body worn camera video editing issue. Um, the conversation centered around the COB's reaction to the editing, the OPA investigation, and MMPD's reaction and next steps moving forward. Um, I think it was a successful meeting. Um, we had good dialogue. Um, and just trying to get an understanding. I think the new chief of staff, she just needed to kind of get a clear understanding of what really occurred. Um, her name is Jennifer Rasmussen Sagan. I, I believe I'm pronouncing it right. I'm probably butchering her name up. but um, And so she just wanted to kind of get um, some clarity on what was happening and what our goals were, which I wasn't able to um, present to her without having, I told her I had to, you know, the board is hasn't made a decision yet on what our next steps are. Um, so I would like, and I put on the agenda that the MOU committee will meet in September. I hadn't really discussed that, but I was thinking that would be a good time for the MOU committee to meet and then also sometime in your, on the agenda to give an update on whatever we talked about at the last meeting. Um, there is a, a force review board hearing that was scheduled for the 25th that was canceled. And um, there's one gonna be on September the 1st and our investigator Vernon Johnson will attend that, <clears throat> excuse me, in my absence, I will be out of the office all of next week. And so um, he'll attend that in my absence. Um, the department head and elect officials monthly meeting is scheduled on Thursday, August the 25th. And those who have not attended the Citizens Police Academy, I hope that you got your application in. Um, I haven't I haven't heard back from them who if every who who um, applied for it yet, but I can check on that as well. But that the academy that 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 starts September the 13th and it runs to November the 15th, 2022. Um, and then of course I always talk about survivor resources. I'm very pleased that we were able to receive the social worker position in this year's budget, and so that position is already out there. Um, the vacancy announcement went out last week. And from my understanding, we've had multiple people apply for that position. So I'm very excited about that, that we will now have someone to um, address the needs of the community who um, have, are experiencing um, residual effects of police encounters. And so that is all I have. I'll take any questions. Are there any questions for Director Fitcher on the executive director's report? Any questions? Judge Brown. concerned we've gotten off track and not getting out the PRRs, which are probably, in my view, our primary responsibility. So I'm, I'm wondering where we are because we haven't had any for 60 days now. Yeah. Well, I think the last one we had was in June. We haven't had one for the month of July and this month. So you're right. That's been 60 days. And <clears throat> it's good. I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, I have um, talked to several board members in regards to what our next steps are. Um, so when we had a meeting, I guess it was a couple, I think it was the executive committee meeting in the month of July. Um, I had talked a little bit about what we should do in that regard since Daniel, I'm sorry, Attorney Yoon won't be back until October. He's changing his date. He's coming back in September. Um, I wasn't a really clear with Metro HR whether or not I could advertise the position. And so I think it was brought up on the floor by one of the board members that they were going to look at legal aid to try to assist us. Um, and so it doesn't seem like that's going to happen either. And so, yeah, we have about seven PRRs that are outstanding currently. And so, and, I, and like I brought up to you when we were having that meeting, that it would be great if we could hire and contract with someone. 
um, how to go about doing that. I mean, just word of mouth has not worked. I've talked to people. So it looks, you know, and I didn't want to um, step out of line with Metro HR. I don't know if we can advertise a contractual position, you know, in that regard. So it's something that um, I thought that we could talk to Metro Legal about. I think that Metro Legal, um, Mr. Goddard may have brought it up that Metro Legal could assist us. He brought that up in the last executive committee meeting. Um, and I think that Ms. Fox, I don't want to speak on your behalf, but I do think that that was a discussion that we had, um, how you all could help us. And I think that that is something that the board should consider if that's what you want to do. I did not want to overstep and, you know, start talking to Metro Legal about them working on our proposed resolution reports without the board's consent. I think I, I said we'd be happy to help. All right. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Collier. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Director Fitcher. Following up on that, my suggestion a couple at the executive meeting and a couple of weeks ago was to see if we couldn't get someone um, from Metro Legal that was experienced, that did not have history of advising the police department, whatever, separate from that, to do back up. Uh, my understanding from Director Fitchery is at the last full board meeting, there were six reports ready to be turned into PRRs, reviewed and turned in. And that's taken a 25 or 30 page report that's all facts and legal conclusions is silly it down to what we're used to seeing with the recommendation. And my suggestion was to get someone from Metro Legal, have them do several of those, and if, big if, if uh, Director Fitcher is satisfied with that result, can sign off on it or make a few comments, have those available for us at the September meeting, if they're not what she wants, and we, it does need Daniel's attention when he gets back, we haven't lost any time, we haven't lost any money doing that. It's sort of a head we win, tails we don't lose situation. But when I spoke to Director Fitcher, she, as she just mentioned, said she thought that was a board decision. I have no disagreement with that. So I would like to see if there's any more discussion and, and probably make a motion at the end of it to, to go in that direction, if that's the board's desire. Uh, Director Fitcher, I have uh, one question. Uh, what would it take to actually hand off a packet uh, to Metro Legal? What, what's the process? How long would that take? Is that a, something that uh, that wouldn't we can be difficult? Do? I mean, <clears throat> Metro Legal is in our office. I mean, in our in our building. But what it is is it is the exhibits. Um, so it would be, for instance, what you see on those priors. It could be in most of its files that are transferable. You could email them. So it would be. Um, some of them are like video. So it'd be video recording of the officer. It would be a audio recording usually of the complainant. Um, if there's body worn camera footage, and then of course the multiple reports that go along with it. Um, and so it's not, it wouldn't be that difficult to transfer that information to them. Um, I think the bigger issue that I would like for you all to weigh in on is the fact that, um, I, I mean, I don't necessarily think it's a conflict of interest. Um, but I also want to protect the rights of individuals that come to us to, um, because they come to us with this independent lens that we are going to offer them um, an independent investigation. And so for me, um, you know, that is the only concern that I have, so. Other questions? Uh, yes. So, um, in addition to what Director Fitcher just said, um, I think you make a very good point about um, the independent lens. Is there, and I don't know if this sounds crazy or not, but is there, um, is talking to the individual and, and running that past them to see their level of comfort, is that something that is possible to do? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. If they, if they are, um, if they agree to have that done, I, I don't have an issue with it. I think that, you know, explaining to them what the process is, you know, um, but yeah, I don't have a problem with that. Thank you. Yes, Director Conley. I recognize the importance of the independence. My thought was we're starting at a point where an investigator in our group that is independent has reviewed all the audios, videos, and prepared a 25, 30 page report making factual findings and making recommendation with respect to whether things are legal or not, and then having Director Fitcher on the backside look at it. So that, that, you have some disagreement with you on, but it, to my mind, that's sufficiently independent. Second thing, I would uh, encourage or, or assume that Director Fitcher would give this person 
one we've already signed off on. Here's the form we use. Here's an example of a PRR. Here's an example of a report. We need you to take these reports, put together some PRs. It may not work, but again, we're not out any time if it doesn't. But if it does, we've got a number of people that get their answers from this staff and this board a month, two months, three months earlier than they would otherwise. Director Hildreth, I'm sorry, Board Member Hildreth. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> thank you to my fellow members. This conversation is helpful because I have been concerned about independence. I'm always, as Member uh, Witzel indicates, concerned about public perception, about whether or not we are maintaining independence. But I share Judge Brown's um, concern of primacy. And, and interestingly enough, I was called upon by um, someone today expressing concern about the work of the board. And I indicated that for me, if we have to do triage, job one is always meeting the requirements of the amendment, which is the investigation of alleged police misconduct and the processing too. So during the PRRs is job one. Um, job one got interfered with, I guess, another agenda item around the way the body worn camera, but, but I digress, right? Those are the two priorities, getting through those. So if in fact, we have capacity to perhaps hand those off. And I very much like member Witzel's addition of checking with the complainant to find out if they, you know, if moving this forward quickly that way, or if they just feel like, no, I don't want the council, then they can opt to set it aside so that we know that further delight is at the election of the moving party, not ours. I, I strongly suggest we go forward. And Mr. Chair, I don't know when this will come up or what motion will come, but I will renew a process that a uh, motion made maybe a year or two years ago when we were having this problem that if we need to double up, if we need to have two meetings in September, because we know that reviewing a PRR is a very intense experience, right? If we're doing it well, that probably saturation of three is about it so we can maybe get six done in a month with two meetings so i'm hoping that either a, a motion would maybe pick that up or if not i will come back around and make that motion when we conclude this discussion well I had and before we get oh, the, before we get to that motion I, I i just want to also highlight that uh this uh has a lot to do with our budget issues <laughs> it has a lot to do also with our staffing issues uh i mean to have a single you know in, in, uh, uh, legal assistant that we're depending on is just unfathomable. It's, it's, it, it's unacceptable. And I know that Director Pitcher, as well as you, Dr. Hildreth, have gone forth and made requests for additional resources that were not forthcoming. And it has great implications, not only for this discussion, but for discussions we're going to have just a moment as well, I'm sure as Correct. far as our capability being blunted by the inability for us to get uh, uh, to, 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 to get from, from Metro, you know, what we need in order to be effective. So I, I just want to add that. And I would like to add something to that. We asked, you know, there is this discussion, and, and since, we, since you brought it up, I would like to say that Metro Legal received a legal assistant that was supposed to, and it said in the, in the budget documents that this was person was for the COB. And, and at this point, like that hasn't been clarified on what that role is. You know, when I talked to the director of Metro Legal, it was stated that that wasn't necessarily how that was going to go, that it, that person would also be working in other departments. But the budget paperwork that was released to the public stated that that person was for the COB. Secondly, we asked for a legal assistant because we can anticipate that one person might take off or might be out of, you know, it, it, what we're experiencing now, out on extended leave. And so we are left with not having options um, that are not really clear from Metro HR either regarding how we go about filling positions for people temporarily or however it works. And so I appreciate you bringing that because that was what I was going to say before you, you um, brought it up. All right, and I know Mr. Goddard and others may I uh, uh, want the floor to offer a motion. Uh, I move that the board. Uh, that it approves Director Fitchard using 
resources from Metro Legal to prepare PRRs for reports that have been fully finished and prepared by COB staff, but only after giving an opportunity for objection to the complainant. Is there a second? second. It's been moved and properly seconded that we give Director Fitcher the authority to enter into agreements. Uh, for the purpose of, is that, is that, is I, I'd is say arrangement. I arrangement. Mean, I I've been told by the director of law that that will be provided if we All ask right. for it. And into arrangements to offset our uh, resource, uh, <clears throat> our, our resources uh, for the purposes of, of uh, expediting uh, PRRs. Right. Are you ready for the vote? Any further discussion? Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Uh, opposed say no motion carries okay so uh, that'll be a great thing to come back and report on uh, as far as progress is concerned for our upcoming meeting okay Mr. Chair. dr. Hilton thank you and so I do have a second motion um, <clears throat> subsequent to that I move that we schedule two meetings in September with the intent of handling up to three PRRs per meeting so that we can attempt to catch up. Okay, that depends on, okay, so let me. I'm I, sorry, I, oh, sorry. I'm Go sorry. Ahead. There's a motion on the floor, is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and second. Discussion. Discussion, I'm out next week, all of next week. I won't be back until after Labor Day. I'm also going to NACOL for a week. And so having three, meet, two meetings, may not be feasible for us um, simply because we're going to be out of the office. And then, of course, I don't know how that would work with you all, <laughs> you know, to have, you know, those done. I mean, I'm, we just need to coordinate in order to get that done. Can I say something? Yes. Please. Okay. I just wanted to clarify our office's role as, as we see it. Um, there was a budget item that gave us uh, an additional attorney position and that person was told that they will spend part of their time on COB work. Um, instead of sending a new attorney, um, our director, Director Dietz, decided that I should attend. My name is Laura Fox and I'm the associate director. I supervise all the client advice attorneys in the office and I've been with Metro for 22 years. Mm -hmm. Um, I am happy to review the reports. I'm happy to do the work. I would probably do it personally. I would not hand it off to somebody lower. Um, not having looked at it, I don't know how much I can get done in a certain amount of time. So that uh, I would say is, is an open question, but I'm glad to start as soon as I receive the materials. Um, I'd also say that just as you are concerned about having a conflict, I have an ethical duty to make sure I don't have a conflict as well. Um, I certainly don't advise the police directly, and I'm not aware of any reason that I couldn't review your legal work. But if, as I look at it, if I find that there is one, I will let you know as soon at that point. So I just wanted to clarify a couple, a couple issues on that. Director, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Hilder. Thank you again. I appreciate <clears throat> the clarifying conversation. Given this information and thinking about it, having two meetings means that we would actually schedule a special meeting because our normal meeting is at the end of the month. And we very much support the professional development of our colleagues in attending NACO. We find that that's very important. And uh, since we have just solved one problem of at least getting the machinery back up and going, I will withdraw my motion at this time. And I will um, probably be back in the same spirit at the end of September. <laughs> if things are working well and we still have a crunch uh, I will probably renew a motion for a mid-October meeting at that time, but this motion is withdrawn. Thank you, Chair. Definitely uh, getting through the PRRs and, and doing investigations is our number one priority. Sounds like we have a couple of different resources now available to us, uh, in addition uh, to Metro Legal. And uh, I want to ask you, uh, Attorney Fox, just uh, what do you need in terms of, uh, well, you've answered one question that you wouldn't assign it to someone else, correct? Okay. And then uh, how soon could you get started? Um, well, I'll be here next week, so I'm, I'll be pleased to, um, if you want to send things before you go out of town, that would be fine. I could see what I could get done before you get back. Okay. Excellent. Okay. All right. Is there, uh, 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 Judge Brown. 
you know, what we've had with uh, our legal director uh, is a, a, an issue that he's, cer that he's certainly entitled to, uh, to uh, believe. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Big problem. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's what we call a single point of failure. I'm wondering if perhaps the executive committee could take a look at our operation and identify where we have some single points of failure. If someone goes out, what's plan B? And uh, to avoid that, uh, when our uh, director, uh, legal director, uh, went out, we really didn't have a plan because he's certainly entitled to his three months, but we didn't have a plan for what it does. He's almost back now. But I think just looking forward, what if uh, director went out? What if our legal director goes out? What's our, what's our plan B in that? And have, have sort of a plan available. And I think it's something that maybe the executive committee should take a look at. Uh, I think that's an excellent suggestion, and we'll add that to that agenda. That's fine. And just remember that he went out before we had an opportunity to work on that because it was an emergency. So he wasn't supposed to leave until August, but he, it just happened really suddenly. So we didn't have a chance to work on it. We had been working on it, but and then he just, it, something happened and he had to leave pretty suddenly. So. All right. Well, fine. Any other uh, discussion regarding the executive director's report? Any element of it? All right, hearing none, we'll move to the next item, which is a board discussion on body-worn camera editing investigation. Uh, Director Fitcher. So when we had our meeting last, uh, we had our executive committee meeting um, the, the last thing that we were left with um, was we needed to um, address this in, in, the, in, the, in the next meeting, this meeting. Um, after that meeting, there was a, um, a press conference that MMPD called um, to discuss like what this was because they said that, um, you know, they uh, were responding to what they saw in the media. And at that point, they just, you know, they they called the uh, what they de call they called the editing something totally different, um, which concerned me because now we have multiple things happening in the media, um, and it, it just see, it seems the narrative con continues to change. So it went from an edit and a redaction to now a muting. And so when I met with the chief of staff and John Bunton and Mike Hagar, which Deputy Chief Hagar, um, you know, we had that discussion about, you know, number one, the misinformation that was being sent out. Number two, the fact that, you know, the board was contemplating having an external investigation and that there needed to be an investigation. And then number three, that, you know, what we received from Ms. Moranti in the Office of Professional Accountability or the last report that we received was that we were, um, they were going to turn over the stuff, the, the I'm sorry, the, the master files to us for us to conduct our own investigation, um, which I found to be unacceptable um, because it, we just don't have the manpower to do that work. Um, and so when I met with them in that meeting with the mayor's uh, administration, um, we were told that that was no longer the issue, that they would now review that footage themselves and then uh, give us an account of how many uh, edits or redactions that they thought had happened and occurred in any of those that uh, I think it was 41 maybe around that number of videos that we had requested that they were going to review. Um, and so at that point, um, you know, we still had some uh, concern, or at least I did, um, in regards to what they were saying happened in that case, that it was just a mute, a mute on, like the, the, the gentleman turned hit the mute button on, which is not what his testimony was. He did not say he turned a mute button on. Um, he said that he redacted the information and that he edited. He used software editing. He did not talk about a mute button being pressed on. 
And so I explained that to them, that that was concerning to me that this, con this continues to change. Um, and then, of course, you know, um, if you don't know, there was a letter that was sent out today um, from the Tennessee State Conference of the NAACP asking for an external investigation. And so that's where we left off. Um, Judge Brown, I asked for, they, so the, the chief of staff for the mayor's office asked us and Mr. Button, if there were questions that we had, um, could we send those questions to Commander Laura? I asked you all for questions and those questions came back. I got one, I sent it on to you know, Commander Laura and I would like to give him an opportunity to, to answer those questions and to talk about what, um, because I think that he's come prepared to talk about this issue. But ultimately, I think that we are here to make a decision on what needs to happen next. This is a very egregious issue that happen with the police department and I know that people you know may not understand what happened and what the what the um, how this is a this could be a residual effect um, but what I am saying to you is this is you know going back and forth with wordplay it's bigger than that it's more concerning than that and uh, I think that we need to make a decision on how we want to proceed um, because I believe that this is something that has more implications than what we are um, even um, talking about. So if Commander Lauer, if you don't mind. Is there any objection? Commander Lauer. Yeah. Thank you. Hear me? All right. Good evening. Uh, so I understand there's a lot of, still a lot of questions uh, and concerns regarding the investigation by MNPD and OPA regarding this body-worn camera uh, editing issue. Um, unfortunately, I'm not in a position to answer or address all of your concerns, um, as I know that you have many different questions. But I do want to let you know that all the information I could offer up to the board would be located in the OPA investigative file. Anything that I could give you is there. Um, there's not a, anything that outside of there that we would be able to answer at this time. Um, I do want you to know that the department continues to stand behind the OPA investigation. Um, uh, they investigated to the extent they felt necessary to address the situation. Uh, with that being said, the department uh, welcomes the board uh, and COB staff to open their own investigation uh, into this matter. And the department will cooperate fully with any requests made and will furnish any and all investigative files, uh, any recordings, any interviews uh, that we have. Uh, in this case, to the COB investigators, we will cooperate fully with the COB investigators in hopes that a COB investigation will help clear up uh, some of the questions and concerns that you all have. Um, I understand that there's concerns with the OP investigation. So uh, really looking at that, I'm not sure anything that we did extra would actually, you know, would be taken well, because again, there's already some concerns on the investigation initially. So uh, doing your own investigation as a COB and you, if you have the opportunity and ability to do it, I think would help clear the board's questions and concerns. Uh, and that's, at this point, I think that's the direction that we want to want to look at again, because there's not a whole lot more we can furnish to you other than the OPA file, which has our investigative findings, um, all of the interviews, et cetera. I don't know if there's any questions with that. Any questions? <laughs> Mr. Holloway. From my understanding, you are saying that the police department is going to stand behind the OPA whether they're right or wrong. And sometimes they are wrong. So you still stand behind that issue. You know, the, the thing I would say, if there's something that's wrong and need to be corrected, I think it should be corrected instead of just standing behind something and let it st stay as it is, you know. The people in the community are very concerned because it could involve them. And... Uh, we, as oversight board, we like to be that voice for the community. Mr. Witzel. Um, my question is, can you speak to the changing of the language, um, the conflict, uh, the difference between what uh, the employee's uh, testimony said about uh, how uh, how it was a redaction and then later it was changed to a muting is is that something that you can speak about? Unfortunately, I can't speak up upon that. Um, what he said at the investigation is what he said, and I understand that uh, there may be some confusion on there. But what we have in the OPA file and how it was written up is is where we are with that. Um, 
if there's if he needs to, if anybody needs to be re you know interviewed etc we are open to to assist with that but there's uh we, we understand that after everything was submitted in the press release that was put out it was shown that it was muted and not edited why he said what he said i can't answer that for you but i know that after the videos were put out on the media it clearly showed that there was no editing but there was a muting um, i know there was a couple of videos that were put out um, original videos and so we can furnish that to the to the cob and and hopefully that'll help clear up some of that but i cannot specifically speak on what he said and why it changed mr goddard um, I can maybe add a little bit to that. Um, I've got an advantage on many of you, and I'm retired, got lots of spare time, and I'm very curious. I, we all got the OPA report, and it had links, but we're not on the server, so we can't open up what it linked to. But I took the time to get all of the interview audios and the raw uncut video and the, quote, redacted video and compared <laughs> all of that. I think it, this one point, I think, is largely an issue of semantics. The two people that do the changes for, to, to blur, what, what's the, the acronym for the information that's on the, the car computers that gets blurred out? The CAD? NCIC? Uh, NC, uh, well, we have NCIC information yeah. on there, yeah. There's information coming out. Some of that's blurred, but you know it's blurred. Those two individuals used only the word redacted in, in my recollection. So any changes where things are, are changing, they call redactions. That's their semantics. The specific change was that the audio just quit very briefly while the video continued. I didn't see any splicing. And it's if one, he, he used the F word with an ING, speaking quickly, it was really short. But there was, the, I didn't see any splicing. There was a time when the audio kicked out, but it was so short, you wouldn't notice it unless you were looking for it. Clearly, we've still got the issue going forward of you've got to identify those for us. But that looked to me like the audio had been muted as opposed to something spliced and put together and hidden greater than that. Now, all I focused on was the one uh, profane word used by the officer. So we, we need to uh, appreciate the police department now on all the past, as I understand it, all the past audio or, or fi audios, mm -hmm. videos rather, with audio, whether they're matters we still have open or those that we had closed, any, any videos we've gotten from uh, the police department, body worn cam or car cam, is going to be looked at by the police department and then yes. tell us where minute and second where things are, are out. So that saves us a lot of time. We may still want to look at a couple just to make sure there aren't any others, but we can look and see what those are. So I, I don't think there was anything nefarious about redacting, turning into muting, or vice versa, whichever it was. That That's what I saw. Uh, a rose is a rose by any name you call it. Uh, and, and I'm so glad to see that MMPD has acknowledged this mistake mm -hmm. of not providing the proper training and preparation for individuals who have re statutory responsibilities mm -hmm. for protecting the interests of the public. I don't want to get distracted by shiny thing over here. That is words, semantics edited, redacted, spliced. Mm -hmm. uh, no. What the issue here, which has been stated to some degree, is that we need to assure transparency in these processes, not only for ourselves when we do investigations, but for the public, mm -hmm. who for a lot of their opinions turns on what they see in mm -hmm. these and here in these videos. The question of whether or not those things have been fully disclosed in the past and for how long is the issue that continues to be, need to be addressed. I appreciate the chief's response in the press conference where Mr. Aaron made it very clear of what's going to happen going forward. I'm gonna put a pin in it right there. I'm gonna ask you, Commander Laura, mm -hmm. what are those things and how are they going to be codified how are they going to be memorialized in MMPD uh, staff personnel organization? Do you, do you know how that's going to happen? So I don't have the specifics on what exactly is going to happen because I'm not, that, that's something that the IT department will be dealing with. And I can tell you that they are addressing it um, through whatever means they need to, through the policy and procedures. It's getting taken care of. They understand what was done, uh, that what can be done better. 
and that is what they're working on right now. I don't have the specific policy in front of me or what the changes are, but I can tell you that they are working on addressing all of the issues that came up that led to this investigation. Okay, and for such a weighty type of mm -hmm. violation, can you just again tell, uh, just for the record, what was the uh, results in terms of discipline for those individuals who were involved? From what I understand, they received a reprimand, um, and I believe it was it was either a written reprimand or, or I believe it was a written reprimand, and I don't want to misspeak. I don't have the file in front of me, but I understand that this, is, again, was due to the circumstances, um, and as we spoke last month uh, during the meeting, um, it wasn't something that was done purposely. It was a first-time offense. It was something that was muted. It appeared to the board that it was spliced and, and cut. It wasn't. It was a muted. Nothing was edited in that sense. Um, a muting was, was put in that section. The person understands, so the, those who involved understand that they messed up. And that's not how we deal with these going moving forward. This, it's been addressed. The department is making sure that it doesn't happen again. And uh, at this point, that's, that's about as far as it's gone with them other than making sure that uh, the, the department takes steps so it doesn't occur again. And just to be clear, in terms of purpose and intent, it was found that this is something that was routinely done. Is, it, is that correct? Uh, I cannot say that this was routinely done. Um, again, I'm, I want to go directly to this, this specific uh, investigation. I don't have any information on prior investigations, so I don't know if this was done in the past or not. Uh, but I do know in this specific investigation it was uh, done, and the department has gone back to view all other videos that these uh, these person this personnel has done or, or has worked on to make sure that it hasn't occurred on those as well. So they're doing the due diligence to make sure that if it has occurred in the past before this, that they're addressing it as well. Right. Uh, I, I want to say I'm also encouraged uh, by the MNPD response to our initial PRR because it's mm -hmm. obvious that the people in charge had no idea this was going on. Otherwise, they would not have sent us back a document that included things that they would have known was going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I think that the embarrassment, and I'll just call it that, the embarrassment of high-ranking command of MMPD is well-founded, but I, I also think that they've spoken well to that issue as to how they're going to go forward. And uh, we're looking forward to some due diligence in that regard, for sure. I'm okay. going to stop right there and just ask if other board members have comments. Oh, Mr. Wynn? Judge Brown? Well, I guess I'm semi-retired to Mr. Goddard. If it would be any help to the board, I'd be willing to take a day to come down to the office and review some of these, what, 40, 40 tapes uh, to see if, to see what's there. Because uh, I think it's a, a point we, we've kind of gotten wrapped up in semantics. Uh, if you make a change, you, you've redacted something. Uh, well, in this case, there's a big difference between splicing something in and, and muting something, but it, it's a redaction edit, what, whatever you call it. I, uh, and it, uh, we agree, it shouldn't have happened, but uh, I think the real issue is, is to put to rest whether this was something that was done nefariously or, uh, or as I said, I think at the executive meeting, done out of ignorance or I probably used the word stupidity, uh, but I'd be willing to go down and uh, look through some of these uh, that are in this 40, 40, whatever the number was. Uh, I'll take a day and come down and, and review them. Maybe some other board members might take some and kind of take a look and see what we got. See if there's something really that was taken out of there that really affected anything, or if it was just cleaning up some swear words. Uh, which, frankly, on a lot of tapes would take a lot of the tape out if you take out the swear words. Mr. Wynn. And I would, too, uh, along with Judge Brown, I'd be more happy to come down and review the tapes. I, I just, I, I wanted to, we probably shouldn't, like you said, spend a lot of time on parsing these words, but authentication of evidence is critical. And I know this is not criminal court. I've said this before in other meetings. But I've authenticated evidence as a criminal investigator. The lawyers know what that means. 
if you alter it in any way, that evidence is no longer genuine and cannot be depended on. Nor the person presenting that evidence should be considered, uh, you know, credible as well. And this is about, again, as you said, Chair, about the rights of the citizens who brought us here and, and the rights of the officers who we investigate for these allegations. I mean, it, this, it all balances on the genuine reliability of the, of the evidence. So whether you're muting it or splicing it or you're altering the genuine copy of the video it was as it was recorded the moment this happened the officer recorded on the body worn camera there's no doubt about that now if it was a mistake that's fine it looks like the department is you know making an admission here in their way but um i, I think you know the community needs to understand that almost all i don't i think every board member and we've had enough discussion about this is, is, is pretty upset about this because how can we as board members turn to the citizens that we represent and say yes we're giving you an honest accountability of what happened with the employee that you pay to protect you day in and day out so I, I, I just think that we can't stress enough now, I've also heard that there's been a request for a patterns and practice investigation by the Justice Department um, and I, of course, we're not in charge of what the NAACP does. Uh, in this case, I would disagree with that. I've worked on pattern and practice investigations for the Justice Department, and this doesn't warrant it in my mind, in my opinion. That's just my personal opinion, not the board's opinion. But this is a problem, a big, big problem. It needs to be dealt with, and, and, and transparency is the only way to do it. And again, at the end of the day, Judge Brown, wants to volunteer, I'll, I'll volunteer as well, and I'll, I'll, be, I'll, I'll look at these videos. This is something I do regularly uh, as, my, as, my, as my job. So anyway, I just wanted to share, and you, you mentioned it as well, I just wanted to voice my opinion on how, how, how big a deal this is. This all depends on the genuine, authentic evidence that we receive from the police department. If we don't have it, then the board shouldn't exist. Amanda Lord, any response to that? There we go. Uh, I can say that, uh, Mr. Wynn, that the department has always provided uh, the board with the footage that they are legally uh, able to have. Uh, you know, the redactions that were made, if there are any made, are those redactions that, or editing, whatever you want to call it, uh, with that, that are required by law, and that's it. Um, the, the board always has the probably the, the best footage outside of the just to complete raw footage where nothing is redacted at all the board gets so understanding that i think that um, i understand your concerns definitely um, but i think that uh, the department has really done a good job of trying to make sure that the board has everything they need again when you go back to other video footage such as officer involved shootings the board uh, board uh, investigators or cob investigators go to headquarters and watch the footage um, you know, and they watch the raw footage to be able to see exactly what's going on so that they are able to see it before everybody else does. Again, the department understands uh, there was a mistake made. It is addressing it. Uh, it has addressed it. And moving forward, we want to make sure that uh, it doesn't happen again. And, and that's, I think, uh, where we're at at this point, sir. And, and that would mean that the footage that you supplied to the prosecutor's office, unredacted, unedited, would be the same footage you would supply to the COB, is that right? Uh, I don't have the exact what they supply to the DA's office, but I know the DA's office, uh, I believe, does receive the raw footage uh, because they are prosecuting it. The, so, the authentic, genuine footage? From what I understand, yes. So I, can, I can get exact, but I believe they do. I can, Thank you. Yes, sir. And, and Commander Lore, could you get back with us as to you know, my earlier question about how uh, MMPD plans to memorialize, you know, in its processes and policies, yes. uh, this issue going forward, as far as what's, what's the correct procedure. Uh, I saw Dr. Hildreth, and, and then uh, we'll come back. Yes, sir. I'll take care. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'm sitting here really perplexed and concerned, Commander Laura. Uh, I, I was actually coming into this meeting um, feeling 
that we had made progress, particularly after speaking with Director Fitcher. I believe it was Friday afternoon after you had the meetings that you indicated in the executive branch of government. And um, one of the reasons I was feeling better is I heard relayed to me, it was second hand or third hand, but that there was a true acknowledgement of error, a sort of unvarnished taking responsibility that this was wrong, it was a problem, and that there was some remedial steps being discussed. I'm gonna be very honest. Your presentation, Commander Laura, does not align with what was communicated to me. And I can't find fault with you, but I'm gonna say, I'm sitting here feeling spun by somebody. I'm hearing something in one ear leading up to this meeting. And then I come in here and I hear something else. And this actually goes to the level of trust that is a problem that brought this board into creation and why it feels like we are in Groundhog's Day. Every single meeting retreading information. And so I just need to state, I think, I, I really hate to see this go into a September meeting. We're gonna have, I hope, at least three PRRs to work on. I can't imagine that we have time to do this. But I'm going to ask respectfully at the next meeting that you be present, mm -hmm. that Ms. Morante be present, that Mr. John Button be present, and I'm naming individuals that I know were in the meetings that you talked about and also two executive committee meetings ago. I was ill last meeting. So the one before that, when we talked about it, and that's Ms. 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 Moranti was. The math isn't mathing, as the kids would say. And so I would just like for everybody to be at the table so that when a statement is made, all heads can nod or if somebody would like to make a correction because we have misunderstood, I think we are all deserving of that. To move on though very quickly, Ms. Chair, and I'm not gonna belabor here. I want to repeat my commentary on the record in the July meeting that at this point, intent is irrelevant. We have a systemic harm it requires a systemic remediation. And that remediation ought not come at the expense of this board's limited budget, nor on the good offices of its tireless voluntary board members. Because as I said to a member of Metro government today, the difference here is you're being paid to have this conversation with us. We are not being paid to do this. We are not being paid to go down and spend hours listening to and doing the work. And we're not gonna ask this staff to spend the investigatory time and resources it does not have because we can't get the PRRs done. How does it make sense that the police department can cause a problem that interferes with us doing the work and then you keep asking us to do the work of investigating the problem that was caused. Now, Commander Laura, I know you're just the messenger and you bear the brunt of my message often, but please ensure that your leadership understand very clearly that this board is not pleased, it is not placated, and if our time is going to be wasted, everybody's time going to be spent. We would like to hear from everybody at the next meeting. Thank you. Yes, uh, Commander Lord, can you make that request that those individuals appear at the next meeting, or is that something that you have to work through? I will. I'll bring that request back to the department. Thank you, yes, sir. Uh, I saw. I saw Mr. Holloway and then Mr. Goddard. As we um, find it to be that is. It was an act that was not accidental. It was done intentionally. Something that he normally does, his own statement. And um, this is something that happened for a reason. Turn the light on, something that we need to be looking at 
down the road, even looking at some uh, prior recordings. And I know you're here to represent the police department. I knows how selective and how careful you are in making your answers. And uh, you're not here to put the police department in the fire, but we are here to front the police department because we represent the people of the community. And we must say this was an intentional act and we cannot let this, uh, we shouldn't sugarcoat it. And we should deal with it as we should. Mr. Scott, just a couple of comments. I, I, I view some of this issue the way uh, Member Hilvers does, but, but largely come to different place with it. I would like to note that the police department in, I believe, December of last year had someone above the two I was talking about learn of redactions of videos and put a stop to it immediately. So that was stopped before we had any comments back. Now, what didn't happen was we weren't told, hey, this has been happening. We may have sent you some videos that aren't all they need to be. We need to look back at that. That warrants further discussion, I think. Maybe you need to address an MOU or other things. But I did not want that uh, that issue, not uh, that fact, to be overlooked in this. Uh, thank you, Mr. Goddard. Um, I'd like to know, uh, because I, I'm, I'm kind of of the mind now that, you know, an internal investigation utilizing our resources is just not fair play, uh, nor is it reasonable, uh, I do not believe. Uh, what, what would be, Director Pitch, do you have any idea of what would be an outside agency that might be the appropriate agency to possibly approach in regards to doing an investigation? And what, what's the process? Um, how does that work? So, you know, as I look at everything that I'm digesting, everything that everyone is saying, and, you know, I understand Member Wynn said that he didn't think that this was a patterns in practice investigation. Um, and, and I understand what those look like. They have certain criteria, unlawful searches, bias policing. I do think that this is escalated to the fact that I believe that it, it, whether or not it's called a patterns or practice investigation, I do think that there is some enough systemic issues within this police department that should be escalated to an external um, uh, department to do this investigation thoroughly um, would be able to get the response that they, uh, I think, would that we would not get. Um, and I do think that that is the Department of Justice to handle this. And so what that looks like is we would have to make some contact with them and tell them these are the certain issues that have happened. Um, this doesn't just end with this redaction issue. It wasn't just, it wasn't that long ago where they had multiple issues with sexual harassment. Um, they had, you know, so, they've had so many lawsuits against them in regards to how officers, female officers are being treated. That is brought up in, in the NAACP's report. I mean, it's one thing after the other. And they're not responding. I know we all want to think that they're responding really well to this COB and they're doing that. We know that the chief has not sustained our uh, responses. That's something that has happened regularly. Um, even in this investigation, the police department, the chief of police and the rest of them, the first thing that they did was issue a written reprimand for something that is disegregious so that we don't have the opportunity to even address any type of disciplinary issue. This is a consistent, and it has been happening for months. We have brought it up in board, in board meeting after board meeting that this is happening. It is a way to obstruct this process. And it, it seems like we continue to have them send in, you know, Commander Lara or whomever else to try to downplay these very serious issues that are happening within this police department that is really affecting our community members. I think it is unfair for, uh, for me to continue to have these conversations behind closed doors with the department's administra with the with the administration from the mayor, and then they tell me they're going to do these things, and then they come in with no answers, the same thing. It's month after month after month. We're not going to get anywhere. This is not going to change. 
it's not going to change unless we do something, I think, um, and escalate this to a higher authority. And I believe my response here is that we can contact the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division to conduct a thorough investigation on why for over a year and a half, a year and a half, redactions were being made to video footage, not only to us, but to the whole community, whoever requested those. And it was not tracked. If it, wasn't, if it wasn't a big deal, why didn't they keep a log of it? They did not. They purposefully and intentionally made redactions and did not keep a record of them. To me, that is a, enough, a, that in itself shows me that whoever was doing this did it without, and, and if they did, and if they did, if they did, take and had a log on it, then we wouldn't be having this conversation today. Mr. Goddard. Say, and I will try to be economic with it, but I can't quite be brief. Um, first, I want to say we know of exactly one redaction that's problematic. We don't know how many they are, and that's the big problem. We are going to find out in due course how many there are. If there are one or two or three, we've got one problem. If there are 400, we've got an enormous different problem. And talking about referring to the Department of Justice at this point makes no sense to me. Um, it, one of my last points will be that I don't think we can do this under the charter without conducting our own investigation first. I just wanted to give you that as a heads up. I'll get to that because legal technicalities are important, but they're not my main point here. Um, I think we should do our own investigation. I think that is what we are set up to do is to investigate police misconduct. This idea that it needs to be an outside investigation, that's us. That's what the charter says. The outside investigators of the police department are the community oversight board. If we don't have enough people to do all that's on our plate, then we need to prioritize. And I would suggest this be priority number one. The, the, CO, the internal investigation was five people. From what I heard on the audio, that's all. Maybe one more. Don Aaron, maybe another one needs to be talked to. I'm not sure. It does, it's not the kind of investigation that's going to drag on for a long time. It's not the kind of investigation that a good investigator would take a lot of time to get in. If we do not find the police department cooperative, which I don't expect, but it's a possibility, if we find we're running into problems and we cannot adequately conduct an investigation, that should be brought back promptly to this board. But if we can conduct one, if we have the leadership to conduct one, the staff to conduct one, and some things, some PRRs get pushed back a couple of weeks or something, that's what we need to do. This is more important in my opinion. We are certainly, the conversation I hear today is that that is significantly more important. Um, and I think this board has the ability to set that priority. Um, I think if we don't do that, if we say we've got a huge problem and we're the oversight board and we're charged with the ability to investigate and call witnesses and interview witnesses under oath and all of that and say, no, we know one, one item here and we're gonna throw it to the Department of Justice, we lose all credibility. I think that's a problem. I think the General Assembly is a big problem. If we, at this point, pull that trigger, I think there's a chance we have our wings greatly clipped, and any clipping will affect every COB across the state. That's a very real political issue. I just ask each of you to think about that, come to your own conclusion, not conclude I'm right, other than I do strongly encourage you to <laughs> conclude that that is a real political issue. Um, in the, the statute, it's, it's axiomatic. In municipal law, it, it, in most states, I know in Tennessee, that municipalities and their boards and agencies have only the authority which is granted to them by statute or ordinance. Our charter gives only, our charter addresses referrals to other agencies, criminal investigative agencies. It says the board has the option, we don't have to, but we can has the option of forwarding resolution reports. Those are our reports after conducting an investigation ourselves that produce factual findings of criminal misconduct and civil rights violations to the district attorney, that's the Davidson County District Attorney, the grand jury, again, Davidson County, or the United States Attorney. We don't have the authority to refer to the Department of Justice in any event. 
I think the U district, U.S. attorney would if, if he or she found interest in it. And we don't have the authority, in my opinion, uh, to make any referral until we've done an investigation. How deep, how hard, how far we press before we decide we can't get any farther, a lot of play there. But the idea we can refer today or without doing our own investigation, I believe, is violence of law. I've asked uh, Laura about that. I've asked Legal Director Dietz about that today. I was so concerned, and my understanding is it's, it's legal department's opinion that that is a correct reading of that section. Um, Uh, with that, I would just ask Commander Laura if you have any idea how long Metro OPA, Police Department OPA, thinks it will take to review the videos and give a list of redactions by video, by minute and second, on all those 44 videos. Um, I can find out. I don't have any idea because I don't know how long those videos are, but I'll find out and I can have an answer to you probably by tomorrow. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll call and contact them and contact those who are dealing with the redactions or the, the reviewing of those. So you want to know how long it will take to finalize the review of all the videos prior to this investigation? The, the ones that were discussed in the media. I understand it was 44 videos, maybe sure. something on that ballpark. All of those to have that done so we have a total reductions of profanity by officer, anything else that might be problematic um, by officers that have been redacted and, and mm -hmm. see some magnitude of what we got to be able to make a decision. We may be able to make a decision tonight if we want to investigate ourselves, but if, if we're concerned about the magnitude of that, have a better idea. Uh, I'll look into that first thing tomorrow. I, personally, I would strongly, strongly encourage you and the department to do that as quickly as humanly possible, mm -hmm. given what we're dealing with. Well, I understand they've they've already started, so it may be okay. something that's already there. Uh, but I don't want to say it is until I find out. But I will find out first thing tomorrow. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry for the length of that. Oh, that's right. Dr. Right. Hilder. Thank you. I'll be brief. Member Goddard, that was extremely helpful. Thank you for taking us to the language of the the ordinance. I think that's always extremely important. And you reminded me of something that we spoke of in the. Um, executive committee meeting, I think I raised it then. So the district attorney, I, so where I'm almost ready to sort of join you on, we are an investigating entity and I'm not willing to concede the point that we should pull back our resources to do that while the PRRs are adding up. Would it be appropriate to take um, General Funk up on his offer of support that he offered to this body uh, maybe almost three years ago when he came, he brought some of his lieutenants and said anything they can do to help. Could we ask General Funk if they're investigators, I'm not asking for a criminal investigation, but if their investigatory resources could be uh, sort of assigned to help us out with this? I don't know the legalities of that. I think it would have a greater chance of being legal and helpful if investigators were operating under some specific direction, one of our investigators or our executive director in conducting that investigation, not completely third party. So if we took up what you suggest, we are the investigatory body of alleged police misconduct. Correct. And this was problematic. So we may vote to investigate ourselves, but then our investigation would be place of phone call to the district attorney's office to see if they could assist us with it under our supervision? I, I'm, I think I'm, I want to think about that. I'm okay. open to that. I, again, we talk about investigating ourselves. I have a very different view of that. We are one entity. The police department is another entity. We, separate from the police, not beholden to the police, can usually say critical things of the police, are investigating a separate right. group. Okay. And I'm agreeing with you. What the, the, the point that I refuse to concede is that we can be subverted from our very important primary work because now we have to do this. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get both here. And I'm trying to find out what other entities are legally and lawfully available to us that could help us with the investigation. And by the language that you just read, it suggests to me that perhaps a phone call to the district attorney to see if their investigatory resources could assist us with this would be fine. And then my last question is, if we're gonna do this, and to follow on your question, 
Commander Laura, how quickly can this be done? It would be great if we could have preliminary results of at least of the 40 by the executive committee meeting. You see, I'm trying to make good use of, so yeah. we don't have to wait a, wait a month. This body plans to do officially publicly noticed work via its offices through the executive committee, say in two weeks time. So if there can be any kind of escalation towards hoping to meet that time stamp. But thank you for opening that and I hope that those questions that we I threw understand. up in the air can be worked on and uh, can help us to get to an acceptable an acceptable way forward with this. Yeah. Uh, again, I, I think that's the question of how quickly can we get that, that yeah. information. And, and I can I can go tomorrow and see where they're at with the process. Uh, I believe, again, that they had already started the process. Mm -hmm. Again, it may have been completed already. Um, as soon as tomorrow morning, I will make sure that I find out and give, uh, I can send it to either uh, Director Fitchard or someone who's designated uh, what that information is and where, where on the timeline we are with uh, getting that to completed. Yeah. And I, I just want to, uh, just a little bit of pushback, uh, Mr. Goddard, on uh, your reading uh, of the charter. Uh, the charter is, is very specific up front as to what we have the obligation to investigate, and those are acts of police misconduct. Okay. Let me ask you, are these sworn officers? No, sir. They're civilians. They are not. They're civilian employees. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. All right. Uh, would they fall under the purview of the MNPD uh, code of conduct? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, are they uh, uh, individuals who uh, are uh, at tasks to know the code like a police officer on the street? Uh, the, policies that, that pertain to them, they, they uh, have I'm the responsibility I'm talking about the MMP, I'm talking for patrol, for police, sworn police officers. They, they, are, uh, they are to know all those that pertain to themselves. They're not sworn, so there's a lot of things in our, in our uh, manual that don't does not pertain to them because they are not sworn so all things that pertain to them and their job duties um yes they are they are responsible for understanding that mm -hmm. i understand that we're, that that we're all in, in metro that way but civil mm -hmm. service employees but let me ask you uh, is there a different organization that represents these individuals other than like any type of fraternal order not that i know of okay. I, i'm not saying that there isn't but I, I'm are they a member of, of the fraternal order uh, I don't believe they are, but again, I can't, I can't speak to that because I don't know. My, my, my question goes to one simple point, and that is, is that our authority extends to sworn police officers. As, as, it, that could be one interpretation mm -hmm. to investigate, as it says, in the preamble, uh, to investigate issues of police misconduct. That does not say go in and investigate civilian employees who may or may not be out of policies that do not have anything to do with the same type of, 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 of level of accountability as a sworn police officer has. And so therefore, I would suggest, Mr. Goddard, that that premise does not stand, that we have the right obligation or resources even to go in and to investigate something that, has, that, that is not, does not fall into our purview of investigation. And so therefore, while it certainly may not uh, be uh, uh, something that uh, is able to be brought to the Department of Justice. Uh, those remedies that you point out are, are, I believe, very, very clear. Not that it excludes us from doing that, but it is inclusionary in terms of our ability to actually uh, to uh, request an outside independent investigator. Because this, this really, you know, comes down to uh, as uh, as, as uh, Member Wynn said earlier, it comes down to authentication of evidence, okay? Authentication of evidence uh, is, is, is not uh, something that we would, you know, expect would be a part of a, you know, conduct that uh, we would investigate the same way if it was a sworn police officer versus a civilian employee, okay? Mm -hmm. so, my hope, my point is, is that I believe that it does not fall up under our obligation to investigate for those reasons, and that therefore, in order to get an impartial type of response, I would like to again uh, ask uh, Director uh, Fitcher now in terms of sending it to uh, DAG, what would that process look like? I'm not sure what that process looks like. I would 
just probably have to call a meeting with the general um, to talk to him about what the process looks like. Um, you know, that would be one thing to do. Um, we also have the option to take it straight to the United States Attorney's Office. Um, that's a second option. Um, but I will say that when we talk about that, I appreciate what you said. But I also, I, when I look at this, you know, you have two, three civilian employees that are involved, as well as two sworn uh, members who were not disciplined at all. Mm -hmm. So what we, what we see here is that the two, basically the two employees, the civilians, the, on the, the ones who are doing these redactions, you know, it was never brought out in the investigation who told them to do it and why, right? And so at this point, you know, we don't know whether or not based on their testimony, you know, the, the, the sworn officers that they had no knowledge of this. And so I'm a little concerned with this, the investigation in general. And I do believe that whether it's the DAG the, or it, whether it's the United States Attorney's Office, since, you know, but whoever needs to do it, it's something that needs to be done that we, 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 we're not able to accomplish it. All right, and I'd also like to bring this board's attention to the MOU between uh, uh, the uh, COB uh, and the DAG and the MNPD. Mm -hmm. uh, it talks about evidence, specifically about evidence, that if in the event that we believe that we are not getting the right and correct uh, and expedient evidence associated with one of our investigations, that we have the right to make application to the chancery on the basis of it being evidence. So it clearly calls out remedies for evidence differently than it does for, uh, let's say, uh, something like a civilian employee uh, you know, doing something to violate a general policy. So if we're going to follow uh, what our obligations and rights are, I would think that we would be remiss uh, not to honor those portions of, or, or to acknowledge those portions of the MOU and, and for the purposes of, of fairness, I, I'd like to call on uh, Mr. Goddard. Um, I would caution to be a little careful about saying, writing too much on these not being sworn officers. We don't have any authority if they're not sworn officers. Um, and we can't make any recommendation. Predicate to that is we've conducted an investigation. I think the issue is broad enough within the department that there are sworn officers involved and that gives us plenty of authority to go in and conduct an investigation, including interviewing and, and coming to conclusions about the actions of the not sworn officers in the IT department. The investigation, uh, Director Fisher did ask who told you this and who knew about it. Now. I can't swear they all answered truthfully. I can't, don't even think they didn't. But one of the, the, the more senior of the two non-sworn officers said she routinely did this before December when it stopped. And she, and she knew the other person routinely did it, had been directed to do that. And she assumed it was her that told him, although she didn't have a distinct recollection of that. Each of them said they weren't told to do it by anybody else. So you may choose believe or not believe that, but it wasn't because the question wasn't asked. That was part of, of the, the thing. I, I think it would be helpful. This is not a motion yet. I think it would be helpful to encourage, strongly ask whatever our, our strongest set of semantics is, the police department to have at least half of these videos by number and minutes done by the executive committee meeting, to have the rest done by the Friday before the, uh, our next board meeting, to have uh, all of that communicated to board members as it comes in, and to have a legal opinion uh, by, by Laurie, if she's willing to, uh, Ms. Fox or uh, Mr. Dietz, if that's preferable, as to whether I'm right about this charter amendment, and if so, the ability of this board with supervision to use investigators by other agencies and, and what limitations there may be on that. I'm hesitant to vote on taking an action, we'll do this, we'll do that, without getting that information. I do not want that to be delayed any longer than necessary. Right, any further discussion? 
Jimmy, for, uh, uh, Mr. Wynn. Yeah, real, real quick. I, I, I agree with Member Goddard. I, my reference, point of reference, when we talked about the Civil Rights Division, uh, and I wouldn't rule anything out. We need to protest our issues with the authenticity of video from the police department. But my point of reference comes from Baltimore, um, New Orleans, Chicago, where a finding has been found by the Civil Rights Division that shows a systematic um, and ongoing misconduct in many levels, from use of force to discrimination, um, race, um, to, uh, to all kinds of corrupt issues. If you are interested, I'll send you those reports as, you, as we debate this, whether we should ask the Justice Department to look at it and compare what we believe is happening and what has actually happened in these cities. And by the way, Louisville is in the middle of theirs right now. The Breonna Taylor shooting triggered that, but they're looking broader at Louisville, not just the use of force. And I'll be more than happy to send those. They're online, they're available through the Justice Department's website, but I'd be happy to send, just so you could read them and make a decision before we make a vote on how far we go on how the investigations can go. Thank you. All right. Further discussion? Mr. Holloway. Um, the uh, people who was working for the police department, even though they were civilian, and uh, they was uh, more or less just in, uh, investigating the re recording, which involved police officers, so we in the right ground. So at this point in time, I really call the order of the agenda. Let's move on. All right, the order of the day has been called. Is there any objection? Before we move on, off of that issue, were there any motions? Hearing none. Nick? Uh, that, that's I'm certainly, trying, yes, your pleasure. I, I hate it in conference calls when I'm asked to say what I just said because I could never say it as well the second time. But what I think I was saying, and please offer amendments, is a motion uh, that uh, we request the, through the police chief that the review of at least half by number and by minutes of the audios that are being reviewed for redactions be completed and the results delivered to the board before its next executive committee meeting. And I, I do not know the date for that, but put that date in. And that the rest be completed by the Friday before our next board meeting, which is on a Wednesday. And, then, and second, that we obtain a, an opinion from the Metro Legal Department um, with respect to whether we may make a referral absent our own investigation under section three of the charter and whether we may utilize investigators from other agencies under our supervision and if so what limitations there are on that if any is that close to what i said before okay All right, it's been moved and properly seconded. I'm not going to try to repeat that whole motion, but it's been, uh, it's been recorded. We it's been recorded. recorded. Uh, but but in, in, in general, that the chief be asked to review uh, at least 50% uh, of the uh, videos uh, that have been the topic of a, a discussion before the next executive committee meeting. Uh, don't have that date, sorry. And that the other half uh, be reviewed and submitted to us on the Friday before. Uh, the next board meeting, as well as uh, getting the Metro legal opinion uh, in, in regards to our authority, may I put it that way, Mr. Goddard? Yes. Uh, to, for external investigations outside of no, the language. For investigators from other agencies under our supervision okay. to conduct an investigation. Investigators from other agencies, the yes. appropriateness of that. Correct. Okay, the appropriateness well, of- Legality, but yes, and appropriate. Appropriateness and legality of other agencies conducting investigations on our behalf. Right. All right, and it's been moved and properly seconded. Is there any further discussion? Are you ready for the question? All in favor, let it be known by the sign aye. 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 Opposed, say no. Thank you very much to all of the members who participated in that robust discussion. Thank you, Commander Orr, uh, for uh, standing here and uh, being forthright with us. Yes, sir. And about, I'll make what sure. you, about the information you did have. 
Yes, sir. And I'll make sure to bring your request back to the department. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. All right. That moves us then into the MOU committee task force update. Uh, Director Fitcher, did you uh, want to kick that off? Shall I turn that over to the committee chair? Or over to Mr. Goddard, I should say. No, I don't have anything. He can go ahead. Ms. Goddard? Was I elected chair? I can't remember. <laughs> Uh, we had an organizational meeting. We discussed a number of issues with the MOU. We asked that Director Fitcher poll the board, and an email went out last month and was responded to for any specific concerns about amending the EOU that individual board members had. Uh, and we are looking to meet in the very near future. Um, the next meeting be just our committee again to align what we want to ask for for MOU amendments and our reasons for them and be in a position to speak with one voice when we raise the issue with the police department. Is that your recollection? That's my recollection. Okay. I would like to think that we've added, that we're going to add uh, maybe another topic of discussion uh, to review in the MOU that has to do with uh, presenting uh, body-worn camera uh, or any other type of evidence that may have been redacted. Oh, no, that, that we will... We will take what we discussed before and what came in in response to that polling. Mm -hmm. All the committee members are free to add additional okay. subject to that time. Okay. And individual board members can email. Well, right. I guess you should email through Jill and get to right. us if there are others that you haven't submitted. By Excellent. Now. Yes, Excellent. exactly. Thank you, Ms. Scott. All right. Um, anything further on that? Any questions? All right. Hearing none. All right. Uh, information report on MMPD response time, uh, CW. Evening, board. Uh, I am grateful to be presenting to you from my new role. Uh, even though it might seem like the same role I've had for the last few months, I'm, I'm nonetheless excited to be in this new position. Um, before I get into the informational report, um, I wanted to give a couple of research updates that Director Fitcher referenced um, during her executive director's report. Um, so, first of all, um, when we were presenting, When we were presenting uh, research on the body-worn camera proposal, I believe it was uh, Professor Hildreth who requested that I, I provide sort of monthly research updates at subsequent board meetings. So consider this the first uh, research update on that. Um, just gonna kind of go over the progress that I've made, the timeline that we're on, and uh, any modifications and next steps that I've made. Um, there's no PowerPoint for this part, it's just all me. Um, so uh, first thing, of course, is that uh, I created a project plan that details all the activities that I hope to conduct over the course of this project, as well as the projected start date, duration, and other logistical details of each activity. Uh, I requested and reviewed a number of uh, pieces of information from MNPD, including their body-worn camera policy, the IT department's body-worn camera user manual, and MNPD's body-worn camera training materials. From that, and as well as referencing uh, some best practices literature in the field. I created and uh, graded MMPD's policy based on a best practices scorecard, wherein I compared MMPD's policies to model policies from the ACLU, BJA, CALEA, COPS, and the IACP. And from that, uh, I began a list of draft policy recommendations following uh, that review. I also created, tested, and modified an audit form for when I ultimately get the body-worn camera footage. I created interview questions for interviews with uh, MMPD training staff um, and body-worn camera staff, as well as for interviews with other departments who have conducted audits of body camera footage. Uh, I also made contact with those departments. Um, I had a short list and I reached out to them all today. Several of them got back to me already, which is uh, great. So I'll have some updates on that at the next uh, one of these. Uh, I consider myself to be on track with the, uh, the timeline that I set for myself with one modification, um, given the uncertainty of uh, what was gonna transpire at, at today's board meeting, really, uh, and the potential for another investigation to be conducted regarding the edited body-worn camera footage, uh, Director Fitchard and I made the decision that it would not be prudent to conduct interviews with 
folks who are in the body worn camera department at this moment. We didn't want to cross any lines that we shouldn't be crossing. Um, so we are delaying that portion of the research process for now. Um, now that we have a bit more clarity, we'll touch base once uh, the director is back from her vacation, uh, given the information that we heard tonight. Uh, and next steps, next month we have a ton of plans to get off the ground, um, including scheduling and conducting ride-alongs, uh, scheduling and conducting those interviews that I referenced uh, with uh, outside agencies who've conducted audits, planning town halls and focus groups with criminal justice stakeholders, and then making the big data request that I'm gonna be making uh, for this project, which is a random sample of body camera footage, random sample of form 213s, and copies of the audits that MMPD currently conducts. So that is sort of the update on that. Uh, I'm gonna give one more quick update before I get into that report. And if you have any questions about this or the other quick update, we can do those then. Um, Director Fitcher also referenced the uh, policy tracking report that I brought to you two months ago, wherein we compared the recommendations that the board has made to whether the department has accepted and implemented those recommendations. You might recall Commander Lara and I having a conversation about that a couple months ago at the board meeting. Um, we all decided it would be the best course of action to um, just have another, a, another meeting where we kind of clarified those points of disagreement. Um, so we did have that meeting two weeks ago today. Uh, the director and I met with Commander Lara and Commander Gilder. It was a useful conversation, I felt. Um, they weren't able to provide you know, fixes or answers right on the spot, but uh, we did get an update yesterday from Commander Gilder that uh, they've been following up with a number of different sections to get answers to our questions and to prepare a response for us. Um, they had some delays to the speaking to the commander of the background and recruitment section due to him being out of town, but they expect to have answers for us by next Friday. So we should be able to bring that update, um, hopefully to the executive committee, or if not to the full board meeting next month. So those are those two updates out of the way. Are there any questions before I proceed? Seeing none, great. Um, we will get into the informational report then. All right, so just uh, first thing to highlight, of course, is that this is an informational report, meaning it carries no recommendations to the board, I'm not asking you to take any particular action on this today. Um, I'm simply asking, or simply bringing this to you because this is something that we as a department have received uh, increasing uh, reports on uh, through a variety of channels, but I'll get into that in a moment. Uh, next slide. So, uh, as I said, we've been receiving a number of, oh, and I do actually have some copies of this PowerPoint. Maybe I should pass those out so you don't have to crane your necks. Do you care? All right. Um, so we've been receiving information from a number of channels, including uh, national and local news reports, a number of complaints that we have received, and anecdotes shared with the department, specifically highlighting that long wait times, long queue times, and overall police response times are unacceptably long in the eyes of community members. And in our mind, this creates two issues, really, uh, issues of public safety and of public perception. Public safety, of course, uh, certain crimes need to be responded to more quickly to, uh, in the interest of public safety. And public perception, I'll get into this more uh, on a later slide, but public perception has been shown to be strongly linked to response times, such that uh, individuals' satisfaction, their trust in police, and their overall perception of police are very strongly tied to response times. Um, and to their credit, both MNPD and the Department of Emergency Communications seem to have recognized this as an issue and they have taken steps to address this problem. For instance, MNPD shifted their, their shift schedule so that there's more overlap and hopefully reducing call times. The DEC released a number of electronic tools, including uh, Hub Nashville, where you can report lower level um, like traffic incidents in which there were no injuries and no impairment. Um, and I actually recently learned that the DEC just got a federal grant and they're gonna be researching artificial intelligence processing for low priority calls. So that's very much on the horizon, but all that to say that they are taking steps to try to reduce these call times. And I think that they're aware of this issue. Um, unfortunately for them, they're dealing with a huge issue. There's, there's a number of moving parts when it comes to call response times. Uh, the, the sort of anatomy of a 911 call is incredibly complicated. Um, and there are a number of factors that influence call response times, like uh, it's been shown that there are a number of ecological factors, for instance, neighborhoods with uh, concentrated disadvantage, high immigrant populations and non-white residents seem to have correlations with um, response times. Uh, there's also, of course, a relationship between call severity and call response time. 
uh, such that as perceived call severity increases, response time decreases, that makes intuitive sense. Um, and then there are a number of organizational factors that influence call response times. Uh, again, intuitively, uh, as the staffing rate of a police department increases, generally response time decreases. Next slide. And the next question, I think, is what impact does quick response time have? And counterintuitively, there's actually sort of a debate about that. It makes common sense that uh, quicker response times would help uh, reduce arrests, would help do a number of things, um, like uh, crime deterrence, for example. Um, but the, the jury's kind of out on whether that is true or not. There, the long-standing criminological research sort of suggests that there's actually not much of a relationship between arrest or crime clearances when it comes to response times. But newer research does show that faster response times can have st statistically significant effects on clearing a crime by arrest. All that to say, the debate is sort of out on that. Uh, in my mind, a really important effect, though, that has not been debated is the effect of response time on community perception. As I said earlier, response time is the measure by which much of the population judges the efficacy, legitimacy, and determines their satisfaction with police. So in Nashville in particular, you can see here that uh, response time for emergency calls has increased from 10.7 minutes uh, to 14.9 minutes. For urgent calls has increased from 37 minutes to 64 minutes and for routine calls has almost doubled um, from 66 minutes to 128. Um, it is important to note that all those numbers and the numbers that I'll be presenting are through uh, MMPD's public dashboards. They, I think this is a fantastic tool that I enjoy utilizing and I encourage folks to play with themselves, but that's where all these numbers are coming from, um, just so I'm transparent. Next slide. And this graph on the left here is basically just a graphical representation of what I told you um, on the previous slide. Uh, you can see, I, I won't belabor the point, you can see though that that green line, um, that's the routine calls. Those are the calls that are uh, increasing most rapidly, especially since 2020. And they're really dragging up the uh, overall response time, especially when you compare it to urgent and emergency calls, both of which are taking longer, but are not doing so nearly as uh, dramatically as routine calls. MMPD does break this down on their dashboards to two elements, uh, how long folks spend in the queue and how long officers are actually traveling to get to calls. And you can see there that average travel times are definitely increasing, but it's the average time that folks are spending in the queue that is increasing most dramatically and is probably driving uh, the increase in overall response times. Next slide. Um, I think the, the easiest, low, lowest hanging fruit in terms of explanation is that Nashville is losing officers even as the city grows. This is not unique to this city, it's a national trend. Uh, Commander Lara provided these numbers to me. Since 2018, MMPD has effectively lost uh, 80 sworn officers, while Nashville's population has kind of uh, reached its plateau and increased a little bit which has the effect of reducing the number of officers per capita, or in, in this chart here, the number of officers per 10,000 citizens. Um, yes, Mr. Goddard. Sort of a quick question. We've got some satellite cities that have police authority. Are they excluded from all these numbers and everything else? Uh, Bill Mead, Barry Hill, that kind of thing? That, that's a, actually a great question for Commander Lara, because he gave me those numbers. Do you know Commander Lara? Uh, he stepped out to take a call. Okay, never mind. I, would I would presume not, um, okay. but we can ask for clarification when he right. returns. Thank you. Those, yes. are, those are probably the numbers. Those are numbers from just Metropolis, Police Department, period. And uh, may, if, I, if I may go on, this uh, four day working shift, we've been talking about that for 20 years. They were talking about it before I left. And um, the problem that we have is we're trying to police this city with the same number of people that we did when I was there. We uh, the largest number um, we probably had um, probably a little over 1,300 police officers, and compared with other cities, as compared with as as sad, they got some like 2,000 officer, you know. So we we're way behind. Um, they were talking about lowering, lowering the, the status, the requirement for police officer in this in this city, so they can hire more. But when you hire trash, you get trash. And when you hire quality, you get quality. You know, so that's that's my thing about it. And I think they had two lot of transfer class that uh, just, just graduated. And I was talking to Commander Lara before we, the meeting started, because I got some heated questions for him. 
because I'm very concerned with everybody that come through the training camp. I want the, the police department to look like the community. And looking at these last two classes, it looks like it's a failure. They're not doing, they're not doing that. And um, I talked about it uh, several months before that they need to do some recruitment. And what they did do, they did set up some kind of recruitment just before graduation uh, some of these colleges. And I said, you know, when these kids graduate from college, they look for jobs. You know, so they did do some recruiting, but you can recruit and not recruit. You know, you can go in one area and not go to the other area. So if you want to recruit somebody like me, you got to use somebody like me to recruit. So. Thank you for that information, Mr. Holloway. And I also have some questions for Commander Lara about recruitment that perhaps we can ask together. Um, all that to say, uh, there is definitely a decrease in available staffing that MMPD has experienced over the last five years. However, when you look at that per capita rate, we've effectively lost one, a little under one officer per 10,000 citizens, or it's like a 5% decrease roughly in their available staffing. And I think that that certainly does have an effect on response times. I also think that that is just one piece of the puzzle and it's unlikely to explain the overall increase in response times, especially seeing how dramatic they have been over the last few years. Yeah. And, and so little, so little time, so much data, okay. Uh, but that 5% decrease, uh, not that there's a direct correlation, but there was a 29% increase in response time for emergency calls. Correct. There was a 42% increase in response time for urgent calls. There was a 48% increase in the response time for routine calls. Now, not that there is a one-to-one -one relationship. Right. But clearly, when we saw the dip in 20, okay, and what's going on now in 22, pretty much across the board, uh, it, lets the, uh, it, it certainly does, as you said in your report, it's a phenomena that deserves further investigation. Okay, but uh, let me ask you, to what degree, if any, uh, will this policy that we've been hearing about, about not responding to non-emergency calls, are you familiar with what MMPD, uh, can you take us through how that would impact your report as you presented it today, if you could? Are you talking specifically about their new program where if there's a, like a traffic crash and nobody's injured, there's no uh, DUIs concerned, basically folks can uh, submit a report online so that they don't have to wait on the phone and they don't have to wait for officers? Yeah, the self-reporting, which category would that fall? That would, that would fall under the routine calls. Routine calls. Um, and I think it's impossible to hypothesize quite how much that would uh, reduce call times. I think it will. I think it's a good uh, thing that they're doing. But um, I also think it's bigger than that. Okay. And, and, and that uh, decrease from 2018 to 2022 of available of, of, of officers per 10,000 mm -hmm. was actually 4.3%. I, I undersold myself, 4.3%. Okay. It's trying to make the, the, the math a little easier, but uh, as, as Dr. Hilders would say, the math's not mathing. <laughs> I'm sorry, but have you, our, our deployment or patrol dispersal uh, patterns looked at in terms of where people actually patrol uh, versus where they actually have to serve and, and, and how does that impact these response times? Uh, that, that definitely impacts response times, especially as um, we're moving into uh, Chief Drake's focus on precision policing. Mm -hmm. I know that they, uh, every time they have a monthly staff meeting, they, they're running hotspot analyses to, to note where they are running officers and how they're patrolling. I'm, I'm sorry, what's a, what's a, what's a hotspot? Sure. Uh, basically, they'll, they'll take the, uh, the routes that officers drive. They'll break those routes into points that are you know, through intersections or what have you and then they'll map those and they'll take the points and if there's a million points here, that'll be a dark red and if there's 10 points here, that'll be a light green so they can just visually see the areas in which their officers are spending time. So that's what a hotspot analysis is and they are using that to influence patrol decisions. I'm not privy to how they're doing that, but I know that they are. Okay, thank you, I'm sorry. Any, any, any Ms. Holland. Um, according to the data, the zip code 37208 is, one, is your high spot and they consider North Nashville, you know, and they compare it probably higher than a lot of places in the United States, you know. Hatred will say that's how that's um, the arrest, violent crimes, that type of thing, you know. But it still come with the fact of being able to have quicker response to have more police officers working in the area will help out a whole lot. 
thank you all for your questions. I think they, they definitely add context here. Um, I'm going to run kind of quickly through the, uh, the data. I know I'm pushing up on 7 o'clock, so I'll, I'll go through these slides kind of quickly. Um, you can see that responses for all violent calls have seen increases over the last three years, though uh, interestingly to me, shootings have seen the most dramatic increase, predominantly from 2021 to 2022. That's that light purple line at the very bottom uh, that then jumps up in 2022. Uh, all calls for mental health and substance use have seen sharp increases in their response times in the last three years. Next slide. Um, response times for all traffic calls have increased. Uh, vehicles blocking the right of way are very much leading that category, though. They've, they've shot up in the last two years. Um, and response time for all property calls has increased, though response time for thefts have increased the most dramatically from 2020 to 2022. Next slide. When you look at disorder and missing persons calls, they've all kind of increased equitably. Um, and when you look at non-criminal calls, response times where folks are just requesting officers have seen rather marked increases from 2020 to 2022, uh, in fact, almost doubling in that time span. Next slide. And this is just a very cursory graphic analysis. You're probably not going to be able to see this very well on the projector. I apologize for that. Uh, the light blue times indicate zip codes where there are very short response times. The light pink indicate uh, response times that are quite long. So you can just visually, I have a lot of ideas about how I can look at this data uh, in a more nuanced way, but from a visual analysis, you can see the closer you get to city center, the shorter your call times are generally. Um, it's the counties, or excuse me, the zip codes that are on county lines that are dragging response times down. So I looked at those zip codes and I couldn't identify a ton of patterns between them. Uh, there are some zip codes that are in densely populated areas with high call volumes, like where we are now. Antioch has very long uh, response times. Hermitage has very long response times. Uh, there are some zip codes that are in really low density areas that have not a lot of calls. For instance, parts of uh, northwest parts of the county, which are pretty sparsely populated. And then there's some uh, zip codes that are in the middle. So just from a cursory analysis, it's kind of hard to tell what patterns are emerging here, except that the further you get from the city center, generally the longer your response times are which could in fact explain part of the phenomenon but mm -hmm. i would suggest there's probably more going on than that but for now I'll, I'll move on so this this all to me just suggests that there's a lot of clarification needed yes back to that previous chart where is lower broadway is it in the blue area the light blue area the uh, rapid response area i would have to confirm that i would probably okay all right thank you Sure. And I have, I have a whole spreadsheet with every single zip code that I can, sh every single bit of data that I've shared with you that I can share with the board if, if anyone would like it. Um, so this all suggests to me uh, that there's some sort of clarifications needed because according to the mayor's budget, MMPD is on track with its goal of a response time for under six minutes for code three calls, but also according to that same document from 2020 to 2021, average response time increased from 10.7 to 12.5 minutes. And they did not include 2022 numbers that they just didn't have them at that point. But that number has again increased from 12.5 to 14.9 year to date. And obviously the year is not done, but that is another, you know, you plot the trend line there, you can see where that's going and it's not towards under six minutes. So overall that leads me to have some confusion and clarification needed regarding what EMS call structure is like, what the performance goals are for the department and how they're achieving them. MMPD's system for call prioritization and community perception of whether their needs are being met by MMPD and the Department of Emergency Communications. Last slide, I think I've presented you with uh, a lot of interesting data, uh, but I did want to highlight ultimately what we're talking about here is that uh, people, people are at the heart of this issue and people not getting responses to emergency or non-emergency calls in what they identify as a timely fashion. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we've received a number of complaints specifically about response times, including folks who have waited nine hours for a response to a car crash involving an injury, another complaint in which they were on hold for 30 minutes and then another 10 hours before an officer was assigned to them. Uh, as Director Fitcher, me Fitcher mentioned, we went to a special called health and safety meeting specifically about staffing in the Department of Emergency Communications. And at that meeting, we learned in 2019, 94% of non-emergency calls were answered within two minutes, but year to date in 2022, only 58% of calls have been. That's a decrease of more than a third, uh, 36%. Um, and council members kept to bringing to the surface that even that and even the numbers that the, that the department are reporting 
conflict with the lived experiences of their constituents. They told stories of folks waiting for 20 minutes on hold. They, they told stories of neighborhood groups advising citizens just don't even bother calling the non-emergency line because you're not going to get a response. Um, and Councilmember Johnston, I thought, had a very salient point that a lot of the, in a lot of these calls, seconds matter, but we're not talking about seconds here. We're talking about minutes, and in some calls, we're talking about hours. Um, of course, we've also gotten stuff from news stories where we've heard that response time in the Antioch area is typically a couple hours. Data bears that out. And we've had a number of personal anecdotes shared with this as well. Um, so to that end, and to really highlight the community portion of this piece, um, I wanted to bring up uh, Demika Robinson, our community liaison, to talk a little bit more about that. So, Demika. Hello, everybody. I just want to highlight a few of points in his um, presentation. So one fact in his research is long response times create a public perception that police will not respond properly. Promptly, response times serve as a, as a measure in which populations judges the effectiveness, the legitimacy, the validity of the police. Response time significantly impacts public satisfaction with the police. So I would like to paint a picture for you. A family of seven traveling on a summer day going to the grocery store, and a few miles away you have a young woman at home just relaxing. A call is called into the non-emergency number, and an accident happened. It was no one was injured, injured no one got hurt. So the vehicle's um, car got swiped by an oncoming car who was trying to pass them in a non-passing lane. Then this accident, this accident happened in June around 5 o'clock in the evening, maybe 4 or 5 in the evening. Um, the oldest daughter called the non-emergency number. Um, seven people was in the car, so it was the parents, the mother and father, and their children. Um, the parents had limited English proficiency, so that's why the, youngest, the oldest daughter called the non-emergency room, I mean the non-emergency number to the police. Um, the operator told them because no one was injured, um, they did not have to have a police officer there. So at that point, um, she was like, well, the car in the, the passenger in the other car, they don't have insurance. So they had to stay. So one hour turned into two hours, turned into three hours. Five hours later, she called over and over. And before they got a police officer on the phone, they were waiting for an hour before somebody actually picked up the phone. But in that hour, she would call and hang up, call and hang up. So um, after five hours of waiting, they decided to call someone they knew. But I also want to bring, if you could pull up the uh, PowerPoint. This was his original uh, slide, and I'm going to, I know we've been here a while, so I'm just going to run through some of the PowerPoints, but I mean the slides. But like he said, this was the officers, right? In 2018, we go 10,000 citizens. It's um, one to uh, ten, uh, 20 officers every 10,000 citizens. Then we go down to 2022. Um, there's 19 officers to every 10,000 citizens. So we know that there have been some police officers that have um, left and decided to go do something else. So we know that it, that is an issue. But as he stated before, I don't think it's just that. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, the issue is, in this slide, it talks about the different codes. So you have the um, categories in which calls are taken. So they're emergency, urgent, and routine. So that's one, two, and three. And as he stated before, the average time for someone being on hold is, I guess, if you look at here, maybe well over an hour. So that um, the call time, the wait, the person in the queue, right, according to the chart. So that's gone up. All those, the queue time has gone up. The response time has gone up. If you go to the next slide. So I think that we can't say alone that it's just the officers, like officers not being there alone, that's not just an issue. He talked about um, the schedules have switched. We don't think, I don't think that alone is just the issue. The issue that I think a bigger issue that um, Metro needs to address is the call time, the hold time, the queue time, waiting until somebody answers, and then once you get an answer and you need a police officer, going back and waiting again for somebody to come and assist you. 
So if I can go back to the story that I was uh, painting, um, the, the young people called a teacher that they knew, and they said, hey, and her voice was distressed. She was like, I don't know what to do. I've been sitting out here for five hours. It is a non-emergency. No one has got hurt. You know, the car has been sideswiped. But my father is in the car. My sister is in the car. And that, that poses a problem for them. So why does it pose a problem? At the end of the day, a non-emergency situation can very well turn into an emergency situation if we don't know what health issues is going on in the car. Um, five hours turned into six hours. The teacher left probably around 9.30, got to the scene, and the father hadn't ate. No one really had ate, but she was armed with Ritz crackers and bought a bottle of water because in her mind, thinking they'd been sitting out there at least five hours, hours waiting for the police to come, and they hadn't arrived yet. So she, she takes them that, and not knowing to her, the little sister had diabetes, so I think her sugar had dropped to like 60. And so at this, I think that's the issue. And so she gives her the crackers and the water. And there again, um, she didn't pass out. She made it through. Everything was all good with that situation. But her father was even sicker. He had three sets of medications that he needed. Three sets that he takes every day, well, that he missed. He takes five sets, but three sets that he'd already missed um, from the time they had been out there. So... What I'm saying is that the response time holding a non-emergency situation can very well turn into an emergency situation when we're dealing with people's health issues and we don't know. It is important that the police officers get there. The queue, how long do we wait in the queue? It's an important that they trying to manage that. I don't know how they manage it, but it is important. His uh, document, uh, his slides clearly show that the queue time has gone up. The wait time has gone up. Yes, officers have been um, reduced by one. If we 10,000 citizens by one from 2018 to uh, 2022, and in five years, I think uh, his research showed it was just one officer over those five years. So it's an important that when we get there, that whatever, however they, they do the queue, if it's the supervisor or whoever, that they need to look at that. If it's the operator delegating that, what calls go out the first? We understand that emergency calls does take precedence over any calls. We get that. But after that, how do we serve those people that have a non-emergency situation that can very well turn into an emergency situation? So we go back to the father who is dealing with cancer, the father who is dealing with not having a stroke, so he has to take blood thinners, a father who has to take very uh, medications on the hour, every two, three, four hours, because it, it helps him from seizing. So in that moment, his whole life could change. How? Because maybe he won't have a life. Because a non-emergency situation, because I've been holding and waiting for an officer to show up. Now, I'm not going to say that Metro hasn't taken any steps, because they did change their schedule, right? They changed the schedule. But I, I will ask the research analyst that when someone implements somebody, in his prof professional opinion, when you implement a change, so they change the schedule from an 8.5 schedule to a 10.5 um, schedule, when you change that, how long does it take for that implementation, like for you to see that it helped in the situation? I wish I had an answer for that. I wish there was a number that I could point to. But I will say that this city and many researchers in general are fond of six-month pilots. And uh, they made this change with shifts uh, at the end of February. So we just so happened to be around the six-month point. So if I were just to look at the data for the last six months and pretend that this was a pilot study of whether the shift change uh, impacted response time, I would say not really. So I imagine it's doing some good, and I imagine some good will continue to come of it over the next six months. But this is just one piece in a larger puzzle, as we've tried to highlight. OK, well, one, we, one, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. And just one last question. Can you go to the next slide? So those times there, what does that say about um, when they change the shift? Does that uh, speak to the times, like it, if, it, if it has helped it or not? Um, I think that it's the same answer as the previous answer. We're trending in the wrong direction. You would expect if that were the, excuse the analogy, but if that were the silver bullet, um, it would have changed things dramatically, and it seems to have not particularly affected the trend line for this year. In fact, things are continuing in much the same direction. 
Well, we thank you and, and thank you for that vivid picture of, of how it impacts people. We appreciate that. I'd like to ask board, I'm sorry, <laughs> members, if there's any questions. Uh, I see uh, Mr. Holloway, anyone else? Uh, Mr. Holloway. Well, the best thing uh, that could happen to the police department is when they had a, a power shift. They, had, they ran three shifts, and the power shift was the four shift. It worked between the uh, day shift and the evening shift. So in other words, when the, when the uh, day shift goes off, the power shift will already be working one or two hours. So in other words, it would uh, take up that gap in between it. And that had been the best solution we ever had. And why they stopped that, I have no idea. Dr. Hilton. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I'd like to commend, as always, Mr. Crowell Williamson for the data and making the data visual. But Ms. Robinson, I believe this is the first time that we've heard you present to us in this way. And you do even more if he makes it visible in two colors and two dimensions. You give it breath and life and feeling. And I want to thank you because it puts our work here in context. And even though the hour is late, this may have been the most important part of the meeting because we understand how a non-emergency line with a very long late wait time with a family sitting in a car and can't get anywhere and unknown or undisclosed medical issues with perhaps language on top of it. I think that's why we're here. And so as I close, I want to recognize and acknowledge that the director of the Metro Human Relations Commission is in the room right now. And that puts me in mind of the question of, as we look at particularly the data on the maps, I wonder if there is any sort of overlay or correlation that begins to cause us to wonder if there are potential Title VI violations. You know, saying that a city having goods and services must distribute those goods and services in an equitable way, mm -hmm. you know, and certainly not having disparities that line up with, you know, untoward categories. Um, you know, and I, I'm, I know that we always look at the law here, and so I don't know if they're, they may not be Title VI categories, but, you know, do poverty have anything to do with mm -hmm. this? Does race, does nationality, does original language have anything to do with this? And if so, and we see some overlaying patterns, then this may be one of the places where this is how we do community together. We're hearing about something that may not be per se what we do here, COB, under Amendment 1, but because it came in and we heard it, we get to make a referral to the Metro Human Relations Commission and say, we believe this might fall within your charter and this area of concern. So thank you for bringing the community together, for bringing our thinking together so that we can ask and answer holistic questions for community health and safety. I just want to add to that, thank you for that, Dr. Hildreth, um, that Ms. Robinson was very um, vivid in sharing that, but she didn't tell you she was the teacher that these t uh, children called, um, and she was the one that responded at 9.30 at night and waited with that family, brought them food. Um, so that the father would not go into a diabetic coma um, and have a response to that. And so she stayed there with them for many hours. And I just want to commend her ability to reach out with her students. They trusted her. They called her when they didn't know who else to call. Um, and so I appreciate that. And not only that, we have board members who have also experienced long wait calls and had, didn't know what to do and had to wait. And so we are all touched by this when the response times and we're sitting and waiting in queues, you're calling to get a report, someone else is calling and someone's burglarized their car, we all sit around waiting for that. And so um, I think that this report is exceptional and I think this work, and I appreciate what you said and how we can look at it and possibly um, connect with the Human Relations Commission to see what is it that we can do collectively together to make this better for our city in general. Um, because that's what we want to do. We want to see our police department do better um, so that we can be um, the beacon of best practice um, in our state and in the, in the nation.
Any further? Okay, hearing none. Thank you very much for that report. Uh, that All right, then that uh, takes us to uh, public comment. Uh, is there anyone who would like to uh, make any comments from the public? I see one. Please come forward. Yeah, I have um, the director of the Human Relations Commission, Mr. Davey Tucker. Good afternoon. Well, good evening at this point. Yeah, good evening. Uh, I made notes to what I just heard. But what I want to address is I've, I've received multiple calls. I've been reading the reports and I and others are deeply concerned and disturbed by the recent response of the MMPD to the editing of the body worn cameras. As I listen to you deliberate in the specificity of that, what I want to do in just a couple minutes is to first say this is, this is cumulative, but to ask you to remember, to remember that the police fought against and spent over a million dollars for the uh, amendment not to even pass. I need you to remember that when the body worn cameras were first proposed, it took years of stonewalling on the part of the police department to even put them into action, starting with a 100% overage in the budget. I was appointed to that committee by, I believe it was then Mayor Barry. So I had a front row seat to all of this. From there, the initial non-response the lack of information, the stonewalling, when you need to remember that the passage of Amendment 1 was the vote of no confidence in the police being able to police themselves. Over 60% of the voters, that's what they came away with. And that it created a communal agreement that the MMPD needed oversight. And you've heard me say this here before, the people voted for oversight, but this so often looks like cooperation. Two totally different things. I've read all of your documents, your bylaws. It's oversight. Less than 10% of your work on the PRRs are confirmed and upheld by the chief. That shows to me a lack of disregard and respect for your work. I was listening to Judge Brown talk about volunteering more of your all's time to go and do an investigation. That is ludicrous. That should not be expected of you all. And I would suggest what is needed is a forensic investigation, not just limited to that little bit, but um, Mr. Wynn, he said, genuine, authentic evidence. I believe all of the tapes need to be looked at. There are folk who have been convicted, some who may have even been given time based on a body camera video that could have very well been tampered with. Early on, the community made it known for the YouTube videos that MMPD was producing for critical incidents, they had been edited. We voiced our opinion about that. If you listen to them, there's even a soundtrack to them. Who picks the music for a critical incident video? At some point, it is my hope that we would at least acknowledge what's already known. OPO, OPA has known credibility issues. So to trust their report, to me, is you're not doing your duty. I believe there needs to be a third party, independent investigation, because how do you establish trust if all I say, and I read it in the paper, 
something to the effect of uh, it wasn't done on purpose and there was no ill will or intent. And that's okay. What happens when that results in a life? Is that an appropriate response? What happens when someone goes to jail because there's no genuine, authentic evidence? The folk in the, in the OPA who participated in such things, which are already known, which is a part of the public record. It is my hope that you all would do what you can only do because it's obvious that the police department is not going to do it and that there has to be an accompanying full-throated support by whatever administration is in the courthouse to support your work. Who does the police department report to? At this moment, I'm a bit confused. I find it unbelievable and it should be untenable that two IT employees do this on their own? They just make a decision to alter tape and just doing their job, they just come up with the idea, that, oh, that's a good idea. In most bureaucracies, when there are mistakes, the people on the bottom are the one that bear the brunt for those mistakes. It will take courage and effort on your part to find out what actually happened. Because I don't believe what's being said is what happened. I don't think the public believes, not due to the calls from various community organizations that I've been called, our organization has been called. We work too hard to get to this point. You've overcome too many obstacles to get to this point and not continue to move forward. I understand, I understand that this may be embarrassing, but what's more than embarrassing is when policing is hurtful to the public. This to me, this to me, whether it's a DA, whether it's whoever, I believe that it warrants, because even the mayor's office talks about transparency and all this other stuff. Where is it? When does it show up? Folk are depending on you all. You've been codified to do this. And again, I'm just still hopeful that one day I won't have to uh, say my same refrain. What the city voted for was oversight and not cooperation. I am grateful for your work and your tenacity in what you do. Thank you. We uh, have a request for public comment uh, for the uh, Human Relations Commission director in the house. That was it. Okay. All right. Other than uh, that, uh, are there any other public comments? Is there any new business? Hearing none? I have new, the only new business is I will, once again, I will be out of the office um, starting tomorrow and won't return until the 6th. And then we will be going to NACO on the 10th through the 15th. Um, so I will be out of the office. Um, I am sending you a message on who's to do what, and if you need assistance, that information will be given to you in an email um, on who you need to contact if an emergency arises, I'm, and so you'll get that as well. Um, I am going to be very limited in my phone calls and <laughs> my emails, <laughs> but if there's something like it's just you got to have me, then you can. I will. You can just give me a, a text or something, but. Hopefully, I um, will have so much needed rest, and um, so in leaving it up to my department to handle the day-to-day -day business of the board. So that's the only thing I have. Well, well, fantastic, and do enjoy your time. Appreciate that. Anything further? Hearing nothing. Uh, motion to adjourn. So All right. Okay. All right. We're adjourned. Thank you. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network.
If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.